Years later is a series where I take a look back on past pop culture and cinema and see if films that are 10 or more years older still hold up. Today's episode will be on Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It was released on November 16, 2001. So, does it hold up? What year is it? Whoa. What? <gasps> Thursday. What year? No. What year is it? So not only is this video a years later for Harry Potter, but I will also be talking about the rest of the franchise, all eight films. It serves as a years later in a franchise video. Now, I've never seen any of these movies at all. I'm just not a big fan of the Harry Potter franchise or book. I read one of them back at school and then the movies came out. So that's my history with it, watching these eight films for the first time. So let's start with the first one, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. One thing I realized about this one and then the second one is the fact that they are long films. I thought, okay, this is gonna be like an hour, 30 minutes, hour, 45, hour, 50. Most films nowadays are typically two hours. When I went back to watch the runtime of these Harry Potter movies, all of them are over two hours. And I was like, whoa, okay, this is long. Especially the second one, that one is like two hours and 40 minutes. So that's kind of the first thing I noticed immediately. But this first movie essentially establishes the world of Harry Potter about Hogwarts, Wizards, Slytherins, Ravenclaw, our main characters, Harry Potter, Hermione, Ron, Drake. Draco, Snap, Dumbledore, Hagrid. There's a lot of things and characters in this franchise, so if I do miss something, which I will probably miss some characters here and there, will not remember them. The film starts off kind of normal where Harry Potter is living with his aunt and uncle. They treat him essentially like a slave. They don't really love him as their own boy who's real big, a real big boy. This aunt and uncle, they know about Hogwarts, but they don't really like it seemingly because once they get the letters and then they even try to move out, Hagrid comes in, you need to come back to Hogwarts. And then there's just like a brief history or kind of montage of how he got his scar on his forehead. Was created by Voldemort, very evil person that's well known at Hogwarts. So that sets up and establish the main villain for not only this film but the entire franchise. Because Voldemort gets brought up, I think, in every movie. I'm just gonna say it is because I feel safe saying that, but mentioned a lot. And it's like, why is he getting mentioned a lot? And it's because he's important to Harry Potter's story and integral to everyone else around Harry Potter. So obviously, he goes to Hogwarts because he's being treated horribly in the normal world. So he goes to Hogwarts, running through a goddamn brick wall. There's a nice train. We see Hogwarts for a film that came out in 2001. It looked decent. Like, there's clearly some things that don't look that well. It hasn't aged well. Like, the broom scene where they're flying with the brooms for the first time. That kid that gets chaotic or whatever. Doesn't look the best. But again, 2001. Whatever, you know. Technology was different back in the day. I'm not gonna give it too much of a hard time because they did the best. And then eventually, as the films goes on, the CG and effects and everything looks way better because of technology. So I'm gonna try to remember the characters. So Harry Potter, obviously. Everyone knows him. He's the main character. He has his destiny and prophecy. He has a face of Voldemort or whatnot. He has to, like, do all these things. And he's chosen story that's been passed around on how he survived the great Voldemort which adds to Potter's kind of mystique and not mystique but the perception of Harry Potter is well known and they think that he's a great wizard Ron is just that nice friend on the bus that he met or not bus but train I don't know how to describe it. I guess he's kind of a scary cat in this one kind of he's just really nice he does more things in later films but he's really nice a great friend to have Hermione is know-it-all that's always in class raising the hand claiming to know everything in class which is a bit annoying but because of that most of the time in this movie saves the boys from trouble i think is in this film is the tree bit where they go and find like a sinking tree both harry and hermione they're relaxed but then ron is the one that's scared doesn't know what to do isn't willing to relax and calm down but she's the know-it-all that sure it's a bit annoying but in the end will save people even ron calls her out she goes and cries for her butts they both learn how to move past that draco is the goddamn bully on the slither inside by the way i don't know about the teams i think it's ravenclaw gryffindor and slytherin and draco's a part of the slytherin he's the bully he's the asshole he looks like a prick his hair is just slick all the way back. In the future movies, three main characters are about to get payback against Draco. As of right now, and as of this first film, he's just that kid in class that like bothering the other team. Hagrid is another professor. Like any of the professors in the films, aside from Snape, they are there to be professors. They have a story. It's not integral to like Voldemort. Aside from Hagrid in the second film, but even that's like, that's really it. Hagrid is there to get Harry Potter out of the normal world, teach some things, and then, oh yeah, there's also like different classes as well. Like there's Snape teaches like potion, magic potions, and there's the one lady teaching them how to ride a broom, and so I do like that this whole film is about world building establishing different types of schools different professors and different people different teams and the plot honestly is it's there but once they dive into the plot it's more like oh yeah there's a plot in this movie i was more interested in like oh yeah all these other characters and like the paintings on the walls how they're alive that's really cool as well the moving stairs that seems complicated as fuck if i was living there and had to deal with that moving stairs hell no that would be just inconvenient when i want to live there but if there's one thing i do know kind of ish about the harry potter series is the game the quidditch game 
game how they have like get the ball or something i've seen clips of that throughout youtube it looks fun but also dangerous like these kids they can die from this hogwarts tradition just deal with it i do feel that these games though whenever a scene goes to a quidditch game not just in this film but in the other film feels like we're wasting time it's fun and there are some small things like hermione helping out ron or something like that and then aside from the four film goblet of fire anytime there's like a quidditch scene feel nothing for it and then the invisible cloak which they wouldn't use a lot i think in this franchise it's just a way for the kids to sneak in because they are kids they're small and then they can listen to a dumbledore talk or snape talk without anyone noticing them because they gotta find some way to listen to like professors they can't do that with magic because they're not great at it just yet but i do feel like that's what the cloak was there for just like hey you know what we need to find some way to get them in and then snape now this guy this professor looks like an evil son of a bitch evil right he's gotta be evil and even harry feels like snape that professor is evil he's after me but no it turns out he's trying to help harry potter from like the main villain the main bad that's like creating this chaos and trying to kill harry but snape just looks like a bad evil person he's a professor who's just protecting the students it's like oh okay and then honestly this is like the weakest part the reveal of who was like going after harry potter or just this whole thing is this guy named Quirrell? Quirrell? not Quirrell. the hell am i saying whatever this guy voldemort is at the back of his head this scene and this fight is just a tease to voldemort and when he's gonna come later on but this felt like a plot time sure you know i wasn't wild by it i guess we need to progress the plot this is it but through like magic shenanigans with like a magic burn he burns off this person and voldemort killing him but everyone knows he's gonna come back at some point now i do get it this film was for kids like if you were like 10 years old when this film came out you probably won't be thinking about these things probably have a strong nostalgia for this film right now but i'm watching these for the first time so it doesn't have that sort of effect on me i'm not like kid no more so the sorcerer's stone essentially sets up the world of harry potter the world of hogwarts all the professors that will meet voldemort as a big bad and the villain for the entire franchise harry potter hermione and ron setting them up how they are now and how they're gonna change later on throughout these 10 years and eight films and there's probably setups in this film that are just kind of little things that will probably be paid off later on maybe who knows but harry potter and the sorcerer's stone 20 years later still holds up it's still a fun good film if you grew up with this film you're probably gonna like it a lot more Rivalries grow stronger. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, despite being 10 minutes longer, and you do feel that runtime, there's a certain point in the film where you're like, God damn, why is it so long? This is a, to me, a better movie. I think it gets a little bit more darker because you see kids dying, or not dying, but you see them frozen, and it's kind of this jarring thing of like, oh damn, okay, this isn't a kitty kid type of movie no more. Kind of is, but like, there's darker elements to it, there's more nuance to it, other than, hey, look, there's a wizard, there's a three headed dog, or whatever, you know? Kind of this murder mystery to it. And these kids are involved. A much more scarier film, a much more tense film. Kind of the issue with the runtime. Two hours and 40 minutes, it does not need to be that long. There should have been some things cut out. Maybe footage game could have done without that. You can still have Harry Potter and Ron turning into the Slytherin boys, but maybe cut down the runtime of that as well. That was really funny and cool to see. Interact with Draco without Draco realizing that they're in the same room. Harry Potter, for some reason, is back at his uncle's house. I would never go back to that house. The way that they treat him, hell no. But he has nowhere else to go once he's done with Hogwarts. He just has to go back to his you know typical family normal family and then they also established that harry potter can't use magic in the real normal world because it would expose the rest of the world to hogwarts and magic but just like the first one he gets away ron comes in with a flying car kind of like back to the future is his dad's car his family is a wizard hogwarts type of family and so they go to ron's house and it's like i think three or five story house going back to hogwarts for the second year also i just realized that each film is gonna be a year at hogwarts and speaking of the flying car harry potter and ron they get caught for that in like the real world and i thought there was gonna be like a big long plot point but no they just go to hogwarts they get caught in the newspaper or whatnot and then they get punishment that's it i would have really liked it if this was a thing and people like humans not wizards would realize this and try to find hogwarts i would actually really like that story but clearly they didn't go that route now i do like the draco fights in this film there's like two rounds of harry potter versus draco the first one is clearly in quidditch again not necessarily needed but it's a way for a fight harry potter versus draco harry potter wins the first round the second round is the wand kind of disbanding and it's essentially a type there's a bunch of wizards lockhart professor and then snape teaching these kids how to use wands and it's also where everyone finds out that he can speak to animals which is a special thing because anyone really gets that ability to talk to animals because who is harry potter who is he is he gonna become evil was his parents evil or whatnot it brings up a question like that but the second round the fight is a draw but harry potter over one draco takes an l and then kind of the spooky and scary factor of this movie is the blood words written on the walls but with blood and this is also you know 
know, Harry Potter being at the wrong place at the wrong time, clearly sitting at Potter, but also it's a way for, again, Harry Potter doubting himself and everyone else around him. He starts questioning, is he really doing this? Because he, you know, maybe he's messed up in the head or he's meant to be evil, maybe because of Voldemort in the first film. He's like, you know what? Why not be evil? And he's getting set up, being seen with dead bodies around the halls or whatnot. So it doesn't look good. I like that. Someone's setting him up or he's just at the wrong place at the wrong time. I forgot one thing. The ghosts in Hogwarts, they're just there. They're well known. They're normal. The guy with the head off, he's normal thing. There's one girl that the three kids meet that's like integral to the plot of this film to like Tom Riddle as well. The ghost isn't the creepiest part, which is kind of funny because they're ghosts. Most of them, or at least all of them are friendly. The scary part is the unknown, the murder mystery. That photo boy that gets frozen to death, actually kind of creepy. Hermione being frozen added, you know, stress and stakes to the story and having Harry find out who's really behind all of this. And that was actually really good and creepy and building suspense. And they add more lore to it. The Chamber of Secrets is like this Chamber of Secrets that keep evil out. Everyone finds out all the professors, this chamber has been opened by a certain someone and can only be opened by like a Slytherin, I think. I think that's what Professor McHogan, is that her name? I'm butchering that, but I think that's what she said or someone said that either way. And this is the only time that Hagrid feels important to the plot because 50 some odd years ago, he got framed or he was blamed for opening the Chamber of Secrets when Harry Potter goes to his notebook and he's within the notebook written by Tom Riddle, but turns out that was a complete fake and ruse created by Tom. And then I feel like I'm forgetting something. Draco's dad, he just has this long blonde hair and it's clearly evil. That look that he has is a definition of evil. So once he came in and started taunting the kids, it's like, okay, yeah, you, sir, are just an evil guy. And Draco is evil because of that as well. Oh yeah, Dobby or Dobby? Is that how you say his name? Dobby? Dobby? The little, like, gremlin creature? He shows up at Harry Potter's place. He's a nice, cute little fella, but turns out he is working for Draco's father. And the demons himself, because of doubt and hanging out with Harry Potter, he learns that, you know what? You blonde Draco dad guy, whose name I completely forgot about. Evil. He's not on his side no more. At first, I thought this little guy was gonna be annoying. I won't lie. I was like, god damn it. The hell is this? But no, he just comes back every now and then, showing up Harry Potter's place or in his presence without any notice. So it makes sense for him to be on the other side, but then come back around full circle to be on Harry Potter's side. And then Lockhart was clearly set up to be a fraud. He knows nothing real about magic at all, but he does know like the basics. But him teaching that first thing where he comes in and teaching, chaos begins. He doesn't know what to do. He leaves. That was being clearly set up. He comes in kind of snarky in a way during these like blood written hallway scenes. It's like, why are you so joy and happy? Something's off with you. I didn't think he was, well, it was a 50 50. Either he was going to be evil and going to be a part of this whole blood thing or he's a fraud and then turn out to be the second he's just a coward a fraud he even tries to like kill harry potter and ron during that underground thing but he gets caught as well he's stuck inside of a cover book for the rest of his life don't know why he was there i guess he was there to be a red herring for the killings and also be a fraud he has no purpose after this essentially so i don't know why he was there oh wait never mind take that back there was a person missing right i think that's why i think someone in the comments please tell me anyways and then tom riddle or riddler is it riddler no i'm tom tom riddle either way turns out this boy this person is a younger version a younger self of Voldemort and he got Jenny to open up the chamber of secrets he got her to write on the walls with blood he wants to get out he wants to meet Harry Potter because it is a younger version of Voldemort not how they bring back Voldemort back into the picture this way it seems kind of just kind of convenient Voldemort got defeated but guess what he's back it's like okay he's younger self all right you know whatever he like set up the whole Hagrid opening the chamber of secrets way back at like 50 years ago he's the one that got Harry and thinking into doubting himself maybe he is a killer but no, it was all Tom Riddle aka Voldemort but they eventually gets rid of Voldemort there's like a spider scene in this film and that was actually kind of scary the big like kind of mother thing and then all the little spiders come in and you see Ron's face looking scared as fuck he's gonna shit himself but then the flying car comes back I like that whole sequence maybe should have been cut out and then yeah I think that's it the second year for Harry Potter's Hogwarts school year got a bit more creepy added more tension added more suspense stakes with Hermione being frozen Voldemort being frozen people are actually dying are they dying I think they are blood's written on their wall it gets more I guess mature in a way and more kind of dark which i do like i hope it's continued because these kids and actors are going to get older which means that the way they think and whatnot is just going to get a much more kind of mature in order or at least you would hope and think but harry potter and the chamber of secrets is pretty damn good Oculus, repair it. Four. Ah, he's a murderer Harry Potter and the President of Azkaban or Azkaban, something like that, right? This one, I think so far, is my least favorite. And it's because of one plot point, something that's set up and you just kind of pull the rug out from the audience about the whole murder mystery and serious black stuff. But I'll get to that later. The film opens up, just like always, with his no more family. And I do think this is the last that we see of them, aside from like a final film, where he's like, you know what? I'm gonna run away. He makes his like grandmother or the uncle's sister, which is his other aunt, right? That's how it works. Makes her very much bloated and make her go up in the sky. She's dead, by the way. 
way she never gets brought back or even mentioned but we could all assume that harry potter killed that lady or maybe she's up in space still floating in the air in the atmosphere or whatever you know still crying and calling for help she's long gone and long dead really cool bus sequence and it goes on for i think a bit too long and then draco's still here i think this is the least of draco that we see in the entire franchise or maybe i think the seventh one but this one i think the seventh part is the least of draco him and his friends are still being assholes still being dicks and they added more into the whole creepiness of this franchise these debenters goes around sucking people off sucking their essence and soul out of them making it have like nightmares i think or something like that but they like suck them off creepy seems to be unstoppable as of right now i think they're like the coolest and scariest of like the creatures you got like trolls that are huge and big and biters and whatnot but those aren't necessarily scary these things they can fly and go through shit and they will get to you no matter what and then one of the professor brings up the fact that hermione is a bit annoying with a know-it-all now this doesn't prevent hermione from doing what she loves or doesn't stop her character development her reflecting and being like man maybe i should stop being the know-it-all it's a bit annoying it's a way for hermione to reflect and not be as hermione i guess i also think this is like the first time harry potter says expecto patronum hopefully i'm saying that right because there's clips of him like yelling that saying and using his wand saying wizardry stuff expecto trono it sounds cool i guess i feel like it should sound like really hype and i think it is but maybe in a fight it'll be cooler expecto patronum and then there's a new professor named professor lupin and by this point this franchise has taught me if there's a new professor coming in it means that he's either evil or in cahoots or someone that they're not because lockhart was and lupin while he's a nice person he turns out to be like a vampire or not vampire a werewolf it's like whoa now there's werewolves because there's like werewolves mentioned in this film a lot i just kind of brushed that off i didn't really pay attention to it but it's like okay that's cool ghouls and you know wizards and werewolves sure makes sense but i didn't expect like again just kind of teasing that and having to come back later on pretty cool the way it gets there though probably may have a bigger issue with that than lupin becoming a werewolf so there's like a murder on the loose serious black there's like hogwarts newspapers and posters around and the kids are scared dumbledore scared snape is scared everyone's scared and i thought it was weird that they mentioned that in the beginning what well, feels like a majority of the film that doesn't get brought up like i was really excited for this i was like oh this is gonna be a cool murder mystery again or like not murder mystery but everyone knows the murderer but the kids have to survive and prevent this killer from coming into hogwarts or just breaking in and shit that didn't happen at all and maybe that's because of me maybe my expectations ruined this movie for me but the way that it was set up in this film i thought the trio and like hogwarts is gonna have to defend themselves from this you know serial killer he's gonna bring in his ghouls and whatnot no turns out there's this whole like subplot between the cat and the rat between hermione and ron and turns out that rat is an actual person and his name is Pettigrew. and the twist is that not only is this rat a person but he was responsible for killing harry potter's parents and telling voldemort and whatnot and professor lubin the new professor is in cahoots with sirius black the supposed serial killer and he's a werewolf and like they're not actually bad guys they're you know they're just kind of living on living by and that honestly i won't lie kind of killed the film for me not completely this film's still good but that moment is just kind of like i don't know how i feel about this like the my first reaction was i don't know how i feel about this just gotta think about this for a second and i just don't like it i felt like there was something going on here there's a story and then like somebody was like hey you know what let's, let's just have a twist because why not and instead it's like you know what sirius black isn't the murderer lupin took the fall for it or like lupin killed and sirius black took the fall for it Pettigrew, the rat thing er, don't really know why okay the wolf part i like but again it connects to that whole murderer sirius black i don't know that kind of deflated the film for me maybe when this one came out back in like 2004 or something 2003 it was this big thing big moment but for me honestly watching it it was like huh what okay you know kind of felt unnecessary but all right i thought it was gonna be a murder loose killing these kids which seems very dark but pretty much would have preferred that over lupin being a werewolf sarah's black being like i guess harry potter's godfather or whatever and this rat is Pettigrew didn't really resonate with me but didn't ruin the film they also used time travel there's like a time travel thing which i thought was weird at first but i'm watching a movie about wizards ghosts walking around so i was like that's weird nah this is a movie about wizards but they go back in time travel to fix their issue of lupin and Sirius black i don't remember how it resolves how the hell does it resolve because that like was the whatever real deflating for me but in the end they get rid of that rat thing lupin decides to resign from hogwarts because of his past and him being a wolf and whatnot there's his name probably who knows kind of don't care at this point but harry potter and the prisoner of azkaban hopefully i'm saying that right i feel like i'm not azkaban azkaban either way it's still a good harry potter film guardian leviosa has been chosen to host a legendary event, the Triwizard Tournament. 
Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, I think has probably my favorite story of a tournament from different schools. We actually get to see different schools interact with Hogwarts and playing this tournament, choosing the best wizard to become champion. I think that concept was really damn cool. And that's kind of the best part about this film. There's a good middle chunk where there's like a formal dance because why not? And there's like a big lull in the middle chunk. Not gonna be great, but still really like the whole tournament stuff. So for a nice change, the film doesn't open up with Harry Potter hanging out with his uncle and aunt. It opens up with him hanging out with Ron's parents. Ron's place, which is again a nice different touch, a different way to open up because I was getting tired of seeing awful, awful, I guess parents. They are his parents, but they don't treat him like a son at all. He's not with them no more. So the two new characters that are kind of stand out, Robert Pattinson as one of the chosen wizards. Cool seeing him before Twilight. I like him in this film. He's good in it. And the second character is Moody. Now this one-eyed, I guess two-eyed, but three-eyed? No, two-eyed, but one big one. Really entertaining to watch. He has a good point in the beginning of the film where he's teaching these kids or he wants to teach kids and wizards about the dark side of of magic and wizard. Hogwarts doesn't allow that. They want to like suppress and hide the fact that there's like something dark going on. Sometimes can be good but sometimes can be kind of bad if you're lying to your student. But Moody's just like no. You're really gonna know about the dark stuff. Really like that about him. Again he's a new professor which means he's gonna have to do something or play a big part. They're not gonna introduce a new character and have them stick around for like all the films. They gotta do something. But he's entertaining to watch. He's clearly watching from behind the scenes but anytime he's in Hogwarts and whatnot and like he turns Drago into like a little rat I think for a little while. He seems Drago like how and shit to Harry Potter and whatnot, breaking the rules just like Harry Potter, Hermione, and Ron. So he was real fun to watch, a real treat. And so they have to like put their names in like this cup and then shake it and they can choose the cup by fate or destiny or whatever. And so Robert Pattinson gets chosen, a girl from another school, a boy gets chosen. There's only supposed to be three, but then a fourth name pops up and it's Harry Potter. The only issue is he didn't put his name in there. Someone else is setting him up and Dumbledore and everyone around him gets pissed. But because of the rules of the tournament, they're going to let things play out. And one person that gets super jealous is Ron. Now this is one thing I don't like about this this film ron just kind of being i guess moody just kind of being a bit of an ass he's jealous because you know harry potter gets everything and four films in he's jealous it's like it just feels quite annoying also he clearly likes hermione so one of the competitors as hermione out would makes him act out on hermione and hermione is confused as to why she's being yelled at this version of ron is really annoying it just comes off as jealous and he is jealous there's even one point in the film where both ron and harry potter are using hermione as a way to talk to each other or just communicate to each other because they're not on speaking terms no more and that part was unnecessary necessary why was it there even hermione pointed it out like this is dumb so they also introduced like visions for harry potter i think because or not visions i think there's like memories dumbledore's memories and snape betrayed voldemort which means that he was on his side at some point to the whole mystique and kind of like are you a villainous snape this whole damn time sure you're saving him in the first film but are you really you know being a double agent here just kind of plants that seed and then before the tournament starts well i guess the first task of the tournament begins but then after that it's weird because there's a formal dance both potter and ron takes l's and asking girls out a big slow down for the film taking down the momentum of the movie should have just been you know tournament task one two three and whatever's gonna happen with voldemort by the end like i thought it was gonna be like 10 minutes but i think it's like 20 minutes it's quite a bit of time overall that whole thing just feels completely useless and doesn't need to be there so the task first one is getting a golden egg that's being guarded by a dragon seems real dangerous the second task is saving a person that you value underwater guarded by mermaids they introduce mermaids both look creepy and cool at the same time and the third task seems to be the most simplest to the cup but yeah to go through this maze follow you and try to eat you and the thing about each of these tasks is that these competitors can die and i really like that suspense to it you know this is a tournament this is a kid's game right you can die from these tasks go allow that it's just kind of like all right you guys are the best of the best know your magic know your wand and don't get killed kind of messed up but also fun to watch i did expect something from robert pattinson's character to i guess betray harry potter i don't know why i thought that but no they have this friendship harry potter helped them in one way and then by the end they're actually good friends i don't know why i just had this thought of oh no something's gonna happen they're going to betray each other because he's a new character never seen him before who by the end bites the bullet for Harry Potter because Pettigrew, that little rat, comes back and wakes up and revives ya boy Voldemort. And this is the moment of the tournament being real cool and then putting in Voldemort like this oh shit WTF moment. Kills Robert Pattinson's character, bodies Harry Potter in a way, but then they do the whole wand thing. A bit of an issue like the big fight between him and Voldemort are just this wand like expected Patrono and then it's like wizard stuff. Voldemort brings back four goonies or whatever, kills all of them because Pettigrew's the only one that was loyal and brought back Voldemort in the flesh. Potter's able to get out with Robert Pattinson completing the tournament but also not because once Voldemort showed up tournament didn't really matter no more everyone's sharing until they realized that Robert Pattinson's dead and Potter's crying telling everyone that Voldemort's back to end off this movie and Moody isn't even Moody turns out this Moody was a fake person who turned out to be who's the actor Jessica Jones purple man David Tennant turns out David Tennant was being Moody but then the real Moody is somewhere else so luckily they went halfway because I really like Moody so clearly Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire is my favorite so far the whole tournament stuff and the 
the whole task where kids could have died was cool to watch. I didn't Voldemort it was a cool way to be like, oh shit, okay, this is getting serious now. There's a big lull in the whole formal dance and Ron being jealous, but I'm kind of willing to forgive it halfway through. Just kind of, because I can't completely overlook that, but I'm like, you know what? There's the tournament and all that stuff. Willing to forgive it to a certain extent. But aside from that, this is a pretty damn cool and pretty good movie. And it's one that I'll probably rewatch. Hera, Ivanaska. This is a lie. It's not a lie. It's exciting, isn't it? It's a super fight. Breaking. Order of the Phoenix, it's a good film, but it feels like nothing's progressing the plot, even though things happen in the film. I feel like the large majority of this film is consistently good, and then progresses the plot. Even though Order of the Phoenix is a secret society, figure out how to defeat Voldemort, how he's back, connection to and Voldemort, all that's interesting, but it kind of gets you nowhere. I don't know, it feels like it's plot-wise, it's moving at a very slow, like, pace. Like, I don't know how to explain it, that's just kind of how I kind of feel about this film. He gets bullied, but then there's dark skies, the mentors come in, trying to suck them off and whatnot. Order of the Phoenix shows up. Now, I believe the whole point of the secret society the order of the phoenix led by lupin who's back and sarah's black why harry potter's chosen that scar and everything right so i like that now this connection between potter and Voldemort brings up the question of is party innately evil maybe that's why he couldn't kill harry potter when he was a baby maybe he failed because Voldemort wanted him to be like his own son something like that i just had these thoughts of like that's the reasons why he couldn't kill him when he could have and then i also think this film confirms draco's dad as being a part of Voldemort's team or is it this one or the next film i think it's this one I think. I could be completely wrong on that, but eventually, whether it's this film or the next film, Draco and his father are part of Voldemort's kind of group and gang. They even try to do this whole Harry and Cho thing. That felt unnecessary. That felt like a thing from the fourth film to, I guess, come back in here and tie it all up. Don't really care about that. I do like the cool newspaper transitions. They use this a lot in the film where it's like a newspaper thing and it transitions into the scene. And then Dolores, I think she's like the best part about this film. She's a professor with like an iron fist. Okay, maybe not an iron fist. That's maybe a bit extreme, but she's a teacher that has these specific rules and if you don't follow them she's getting more strict and stricter and so the fact that she even became a professor here Dumbledore left for some reason it gets blamed because of Harry and Voldemort but you know it's like he left and like no one's kind of in charge or whatever so at first she's just a professor who gives the kids a hard time but then eventually she rises up to the ranks and gets more control and power in Hogwarts and all the kids hate her except for the Slytherins because the Slytherins and Draco's a part of them can't use magic no more which is ridiculous because everyone knows that Voldemort's back so they need magic to defend himself from Voldemort and the fact that she doesn't allow this begs the question of her side. Which side is she on? A good chunk of the kids, they have to like find room and train by using magic because they have this Dolores angel that's watching them from every way. She was just a character fun to watch and then eventually the twins who were like really small at the beginning of the franchise and seeing them grow up. That's also another thing. Seeing these characters grow up, see Hermione, Ron, and Harry Potter, actors themselves grow up works to their advantage because you're literally watching these films and seeing the characters grow up along with the actors. But these two twins, they mess with her and they eventually eventually gather the kids to you know get rid of her essentially her end is kind of bleak but then she comes back later on but either way the giants i think take her away and then both ron and harry they do nothing about it going back to the whole memory stuff finds a memory of snape and how he was younger and how he was bullied we don't know who the bullier is but this will play a big part in the final film this is like the fifth film and they're already planting seeds for the end and then i guess you could argue even way back in like the second film because the first film is just setting things up second film is where it's planting seeds and then he also finds a memory of voldemort killing and torturing sirius black now that he knows that these memories are like confirmed which is why him and Voldemort are connected there's a certain point where they know each other's existence by just seeing visions Voldemort also wants the bottle of prophecy to use for his powers and just kind of immortality because he is immortal which we find out why or how he is immortal in the next film and despite seeing a vision of Voldemort almost killing Sirius Black Potter can't prevent that that seems to be inevitable and Voldemort is about to kill Potter but then Dumbledore comes in to save the day they're off Voldemort and seemingly the reason why Dumbledore was so distant from Potter is because he feared that Voldemort would use the connection between them against them them essentially which sure you know they didn't explain why he's gone and why he even allowed Dolores to run the place that she did but I honestly didn't mind it because it was so much fun just kind of watching that I guess it's kind of a nitpick is the fact that love won over Potter which is why Voldemort's possession over Potter didn't work as love one that felt a bit fairy tale ish and a bit corny that's just really like a nitpick but aside from that I like everything else that happened with Dumbledore Voldemort and Potter so like Sirius dying kind of like the peak of the film Dolores running the whole school that was fun throughout the majority of the film but even that it doesn't feel important Voldemort coming in and then like Dumbledore coming in as well explaining why he was gone that all makes sense that it's progression but the lore's being there teaching magic it felt like a step back from the plot to slow the pace down they have three more films so they have to space out the story that's what this felt like and it doesn't ruin the movie but it's more something like maybe just not have eight movies but there is eight movies but in the end Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix is still a good Harry Potter film but it seems like the plot isn't progressing as it should be 
Draco Malfoy for a mission. The Half-Blood Prince is essentially Order of the Phoenix in terms of plot progression, but what happens at the end with Snape Dumbledore and having an arc at least for Draco for it to pay off in the last film, that's a bit more interesting and has a better payoff than Order of the Phoenix. Teenage angst, hormones are up in the air, Ron is being Ron, Hermione is upset. Now that thing in the fourth film comes back in here which dragged the film down. Death Eaters, Dementors, and Voldemort, they're creating chaos around the world. The kids are going back to school. This is like their sixth year. Each year seemingly has been different, makes it exciting but in universe are a little annoying it's something different every year but it creates chaos every year this one's about finding out the powers why is he so immortal and what makes it immortal what is the item or thing that seemingly every time they think he's been defeated he comes back every time a bit more stronger even though he was defeated but throughout this draco has a mission hormones are up in the air snape is supposedly on the wrong side now or the bad side now so i'll start with the whole hormone stuff so apparently ron goes out with another girl what's her name lavender brown and that upsets hermione because now she's starting to have I guess feelings for him. Three kids they grew up together. At first they start off as friends. Ron found her annoying and Hermione found him annoying and it seems that Potter's just smack in the middle of all this. And this whole thing is just like eh, you know. They're close to teenagers now. Going to teenagers to like college young adult-ish kind of. They're just horny. They're kissing and whatnot and dancing and whatnot. Feels like why are we doing this? It adds nothing honestly. Anytime they cut back to Hermione like being upset or Potter confessing his feelings or Ron and all that stuff. It feels like a way to have a longer run time for the sake of having a long runtime. So Voldemort or I think his dad gives Draco a mission in Hogwarts. The mission is to kill Dumbledore and also poison Harry on the side as well. That was meant for him but then Ron drank it. He's like in love and everything. They had to get past that. But what I love all about this is the fact that he's regretting this. He doesn't like what he's doing. Clearly in his face he doesn't like killing another person. Yes he was a bit of an asshole and a shithead in the earlier film but that was all jokes you know just being kids. Now this is real and seemingly he doesn't like his father or Voldemort ordering him to kill another human being he doesn't like that clearly so this is kind of his redemption arc he was being a little shithead being a bully throughout most of this film and then by the end of this franchise he's gonna redeem himself he's gonna have the redeemable arc from being a villain i guess he is but not really kind of an asshole to a hero and that's probably the most interesting arc because i mean everyone has arcs in this one but draco's arc in this one is fascinating and will get paid off later on he doesn't have it in him to do what voldemort or his father does fears like he would be a disappointment to his own father which is why he kind of goes through with it but also half asses it as well not being able to poison harry potter and kill dumbledore alongside with that snape is ordered to protect draco turns out he's the half-blood prince he's supposed to have been on their side his whole damn time and while protecting draco pointing the wand at dumbledore ready to kill him but clearly draco himself and snape realize that not able to do it so the person to kill dumbledore is snape himself potter sees this it hurts him obviously because they all know each other well at this point dumbledore and snape know each other even longer so the fact that he even killed them means a lot and hurts a lot to harry potter tries to confront him outside kind of bashes him there's a clear like distinct regret look on Snape's face but we don't find out until later on as to why he feels this way even though he's on the bad side so it seems to be more complex Draco clearly doesn't like it Harry Potter finds out that Snape isn't really the person who he thinks he is he's betrayed all the wizards and Hogwarts makes things complicated on the surface level as to why they're doing it we don't find out until again very later on and then just like the previous film Voldemort is looking for an object and turns out he's looking for different objects that makes him immortal these items are called Horcrux the characters find that out by the end which leads into Deathly Hallows as their goal and mission to get ready for war against Voldemort but also destroy objects these horcrux that makes Voldemort invincible and immortal and kind of lose everything not completely everything but it takes away Harry Potter's most important teacher professor and person ever Dumbledore he's always been there for Harry Potter and the fact that one of his own kind killed Dumbledore it hurts him obviously by the end Harry Potter and the rest of the characters they are lost and they need to prepare for revenge and vengeance so yeah Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince is pretty good again it has the same kind of issues I guess with the previous one the order of the phoenix where it feels like nothing's really happening but it's still good until the very end but the ending to this and like the one arc with draco interesting and then snape coming in as well and then killing off dumbledore has a bigger effect within the harry potter lore than whatever happened in order of the phoenix with dumbledore being like we're connected and him and voldemort are connected it just feels like it has a bigger impact to the story and this one then in order of the phoenix and then the whole you know hermione ron stuff whatever everyone knows they're gonna get together so i guess this is build up for that them not liking each other and then liking each other and hurting each other but half blood prince is pretty good Harry Potter, I can live forever.
Deathly Hallows Part 1 is a bit of a dull movie. The issue with this movie is the fact that it's one part of another movie. Let's make this first part all about the setup and talking and have the interesting moments and parts and action sequences in the second one. Characters that you know die but I guess it's a way to fuel Potter and the Hogwarts and all that stuff but even that doesn't save this movie from being a bit dull and just kind of like set up. The fighting in the movie is not even that great. The whole wand stuff but a couple things that they set up. Voldemort must kill Harry Potter. This is essential because it will complete Voldemort's immortality as a reason as to why he didn't kill Harry Potter. Voldemort getting Dumbledore's wand. They set up in this film that they have essentially the same wand. Voldemort go gets Dumbledore's wand which is like an elder wand. A very powerful one. A very different one. Harry Potter eventually have that and then the search for the object starts here. I don't think they destroy any. I know they destroy a lot in the second one but I think they do. I don't remember. And that's really the whole movie like setups. The search for the objects. Voldemort saying his plans. Draco is unsettled by this. He doesn't like it. Moody gets killed off by the Death Eaters right at the beginning which is like oh okay they're not playing around. That got me excited because this movie ain't playing around. We'll have Dobie by the end. Thor that goes through. It was cool seeing them back. He's a bit of a rat switching sides and whatnot so him dying made sense. Moody would love to see more of him but they killed his ass off hella early. Things like Hermione and Harry dancing because why not and because Ron is having negative thoughts because of a negative watch thing it makes Ron even look more jealous and a bit of an asshole a bit whiny. It's like why are we doing this? They're in the woods for a very long time. I don't know why but they are searching. They're in the woods for so long. They have like the wand maker be introduced and Voldemort killing the wand maker to find a new wand. Like pacing wise this is the worst pace one. I think that's the big issue. This movie is paced horribly. It's very slow. The things that are happening are fine but then you got Ron stuff that's a bit whiny. Teasing Harry and Hermione even though Harry wants to be with Jenny by the end. Just unnecessary. Dolores is back as well because why not she's hilarious and this whole film is that kind of unnecessary but it's also needed for certain things to happen in the second film so kind of it's as well but overall though this film Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part one feels unnecessary is boring and just okay Ferraverto. The Deathly Hallows Part 2 is the final film and it feels like a finality because there are arcs that are ending in this film that's been set up in the past 2-3 to three movies. Voldemort comes to an end. Most of the film are action set pieces and sequences and I think this is the shortest film I think. Credits come up like at 159. It's split up perfectly kind of ish in 4 different 30 minute chunks. So the first 30 minutes Potter, Hermione, and Ron go into the vault using the cloak one last time to find another object and we also find out that a wand chooses its wizard. Kind of confirms the fact that they have a mind of their own they will comply with the wizard if they choose you to be your master and so like with the most missions like this is a mission for the three characters it goes wrong they release a dragon they get the item they eventually destroy it this is like the first vault that we see or i guess era that we see back in the first film so it's cool going back to it call back to like 10 years ago and since there's a dragon it also shows vfx and how it's evolved over 10 years in eight films the fact that they can have a fully cg dragon and make it look good still to this day is an impressive feat on the franchise itself see how long it's come and we also get to meet Dumbledore's brother with but like a weird tack on he had like this brother that knows like a secret passage to Hogwarts the first 30 minutes opens up with the evolution of VFX of the franchise the second 30 minutes is a prelude to the Hogwarts fight and also Nate threatening all these kids in Hogwarts and having Harry confront him about killing Dumbledore and and again you see Dave's face the regret that he had something isn't being said or there's a secret Voldemort army suit wand magic at Hogwarts and it looks pretty cool all the wands and magic shooting at a Hogwarts being protected by this bubble was visually cool to see and then Draco he's on a redemption arc trying to scare Harry Potter away and then one of his friends creating a fire is all on him but then in the end Harry Potter saving Draco proving the fact that he's on the wrong side despite being a complete asshole to Harry Potter and Hermione and Ron Draco realizes that you know these are nice people he's been on the wrong side he doesn't like what he's doing so this will play a factor to him changing sides Hermione destroys another item Voldemort feels all of this he fears that he's gonna be unable to defeat these kids the third 30 minutes he uses the fight at Hogwarts you can also see the destruction outside but it's also Snape's end. His arc is not complete and done. He needs the Elder Wand to respond to him and tells the truth about why he killed Dumbledore and why he saved him in the first place and why he had a liking into him in a way. He was bullied by Potter's father which means he had a hate for him right from the start from the first movie but also had to save him because he loved his mother and then him killing Dumbledore. Dumbledore was bound to die either way. He was dying of something. I don't think they say why he dies. Is it cancer? Is there even cancer in this universe? I think it is. Whatever. He was bound to die at some point. Killing Dumbledore was all a part of the plan. He can't 
quite say as to why he killed them, it would ruin the illusion that he's on their side. And the final item in destroying Voldemort is a snake. Potter or Hermione or Ron, they're gonna have to face him one on one. And Potter himself is a Horcrux because when Voldemort couldn't kill him as a baby, that was the moment he became a Horcrux. In order to kill and get rid of Voldemort, Potter must die as well. In which he has a comes to turn with really quickly, by the way. It is quick. Would have liked it. it was a reveal in the last movie. Then you can have the previous movie or even this movie in the very beginning, having Potter come into terms with the fact that he must die. I actually would have liked that a lot more, but either way, quick coming to terms of I must die to save Hogwarts, which is why both of them are so connected. Him coming to terms with it, he uses like a stone or something or summoning stone to summon all his loved ones that have died to comfort him because this is probably stressing him out. He doesn't know what to do, showing some love before he goes out and confronts and dies for Hogwarts. And then the fourth and final 30 minutes is the downfall of Voldemort and getting rid of Potter's curse. When Potter dies and Voldemort thinks that he's killed Potter, Potter goes into this white heaven-like place. I'm just saying it's heaven because it's all white, but it's also not. They don't say it's heaven, but it kind of is. He meets Dumbledore and gives him an option of being free and move on or return back to what is Hogwarts in the real world. Does he choose to move on, leave his friends behind, let evil win in Hogwarts or go back, confront his number one enemy, his nemesis? The move does portray it as kind of a hard decision, but I guess from Potter's perspective, it's like, no, I'm gonna go back and kill, you know, Voldemort. But it would have been real interesting, just like the whole coming in terms with the fact that he's predestined to die. Would have liked a much more complicated like choice. He knows it's wrong not to go back, so he has to go back. Within his whole speech, Draco and some of his army, they leave him. And Draco's arc is completed here. It was set up back in the half of Prince, him not liking his life, him not liking being a complete asshole, being evil. He's on the wrong side. He's on his redeemable arc. And by the end, he makes the right choice. He uses a better life. Would have liked it if it was set up much earlier than the sixth film. It's supposed to add to the whole like, hey, sometimes they can also change and be like really nice people. And Draco is an example of that. Potter and Voldemort have their final confrontation. Again, the fight, the wand fighting is very, you know, like point the wand at the other wand. And it's like, all right, you know, it's not exciting to look at, but it is hype kind of ish. Finally get rid of Voldemort. They get rid of his snake, which makes him mortal. And eventually Harry Potter is able to overpower him and get rid of Voldemort once and for all forever. He is finally gone. Hogwarts and the other schools are safe from this evil entity and wizard. And I do really like the ending of this where it's like 19 years later, Hermione and Ron are together. They have a kid. Potter and Ginny are together. They have a kid. Draco and his wife, they have a kid. They are all grown up now. They're all mature and they're sending out their own kids to Hogwarts to experience hopefully a nice, safe, and better Hogwarts. But it was just really nice to see all of them be at the train station, waving the kids goodbye, coming full circle of having a really good life and then sending off their kids to be wizards just like they were back when they were like 10 or 12. This is a really good way to end off a franchise. Character arcs are completed. The big bad is defeated and our main three heroes get to live a happy life and see their kids have a better life than they did. So in the end, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 is a pretty damn good movie and a pretty damn good way to end off this entire franchise. In terms of the rankings of this franchise, it was relatively easy because none of the films were bad. There's only one that was okay. The other ones are good. They're good, entertaining, and would recommend anybody to watch. So at number eight, it is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part One, mainly because Logfest. It's one part of a film of another film, so it's like you're waiting for that other part, and this is the first part. Set up talking, Ron, BS stuff, all that stuff. Some character deaths like Moody, which was sad to see, Dobby or Doby. Nothing eventful, just more set up for the eventual final film. Number 7, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. My main issue with this one is the twist. It felt like it just pulled the rug out from under you just for the sake of it. Just be like, hey, guess what? This murderer isn't really a murderer. And guess what? Lupin is a werewolf covering for Black. And then this little rat who is Pettigrew works for Voldemort and was the reason as to why Potter's parents got killed. And that whole thing was just like, why? It felt unnecessary. It kind of deflated the feel for me. Everything else was good. Leaving his family. The murder aspect of it was really interesting up until the whole twist. And the whole hybrid bird thing, which I forgot to mention. Of course, bird hybrid thing it was weird at first whatever this is wizards harry potter fantastical it's a weird horse bird hybrid number six harry potter and the order of the phoenix a good film but most of it kind of nothing happens until the very end with theorist black dying setting up plants and seeds for harry potter to eventually defeat voldemort he just comes at the end being like voldemort kills harry was black the reason as to why dumbledore left was because of the connection which why would you leave the school unprotected from like dolores and won't let kids do any magic you left your students and hogwarts in danger number five harry potter 
Fire and a Sorcerer Stone. The first one's still pretty good. The visual effects wonky, you know, the broom stuff and all that. Aside from that, it's world building. It's the first film setting up Draco, our characters, where they would go in the visual final film. The Scar on Harry Potter, Hagrid, Dumbledore film to set up certain things to happen. It's a cool world, but the villain though just comes out of nowhere. It's as if they forgot the plot. It's like, oh yeah, there's a plot in this. Aside from that, it still holds up and it's still pretty good. Number four, Harry Potter and a Half Blood Prince. Just like with Order of the Phoenix, it has the same issues. Nothing really happens. There's like a huge lull, but it's still consistently good. And to the very end of Snape supposedly betraying Hogwarts, killing off Dumbledore, Draco's arc is starting here where yes, he's a little shithead, but eventually comes to the good side and realizes that he's on the wrong side and doing all these things are not good. Horcruxes are a cool way to, I guess, explain the immortality of Voldemort as to why he keeps coming back again and again. And the whole Ron and Hermione stuff, who cares, whatever, feels unnecessary. Number three, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Despite being the longest film, you feel that runtime. I still very much enjoy the world building of the Chamber of Secrets. Much more darker, much more, I guess, a little bit more bleaker where, maybe not bleak, but there's blood being written on the wall and whatnot. Harry Potter's being framed. Kids are being frozen in time, which is really creepy. Just adds more to the creepiness and questions Potter's kind of role in existence, both in Hogwarts and normal world. He doesn't know where to belong quite yet because he's being framed in Hogwarts. While his aunt and uncle treat him like shit. Number two, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. The tournament version. Yes, I know there's that big chunk in the middle where it's like the form world dance and Ron is, Ron is really just a jealous guy, honestly. Thinking about it, why is he so jealous? Anyways, Robert Pattinson's inclusion was really cool. The rise of Voldemort was a big WTF moment and tournament. It was awesome. Harry Potter and the other kids, they could have died and Voldemort and everyone else was just like, yes, prove that you are worthy and you are the best of the best. Like, all right. And number one is obviously Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part two. Arcs are being completed. Draco's arc is complete. Snape's arc is complete. Harry Potter's arc is complete. Hermione and Ron's arc is complete. Defeating Voldemort is complete. Everything is wrapped up in a nice bow. It's mostly action as well and set pieces and it comes back now them being adults and sitting there because of Hogwarts to have a safer experience at Hogwarts and not have, you know, assholes like Draco. But even Draco himself sending his kid off and waving goodbye to all their kids to end off the franchise. And that was the Harry Potter franchise. That is another franchise done on my channel. I'm glad I went through it. I've heard a lot about it and there's like cons for like wizard. I think wizard con? Or maybe it's not called wizard con but there's people dressed in universe of Harry Potter or just characters from Harry Potter and there's big cons for it, comic cons for it. How fantastical it is. I get it now but fantasy isn't my type of thing. It is a good franchise. Most of the movies are good. There's not innately like a bad moment or, or maybe the Ron stuff but aside from that like everything else is good. Some of the movies are a bit too long especially the second one. Why is it so damn long? But Harry Potter it's a fun franchise. I think it's still going with Fantastic Beasts but I probably won't be making videos about that because I don't know I don't feel like watching another fantastical franchise or series. I'll just kind of watch it on my own time. That's it for me. This has been The Road So Far and thank you for watching.